Hello, and thank you for joining us for the Irresistible Employee Experience, Secrets to Prevailing During the Great Resignation. This program is part of the SHRM webcast series. You can learn about upcoming and on-demand events from our e-newsletters and the webcast homepage at sherm.org slash webcast. SHRM thanks Eightfold.ai for sponsoring this program and our series of free webcasts for the HR community. Today's program will explore how HR teams can design and lead transformative change in the way their organizations upskill, reskill, engage, and retain talent. Our program today will be led by Kathy Andera's PhD from the Josh Burson Company and Carly Ackerman from Eightfold.ai. With formalities out of the way, I'm pleased to turn things over now to our first speaker, Dr. Kathy Andera's. Thank you, Mike, and welcome, everybody. Um, uh, we're happy to to have you and happy to um, to um, share with you all the secrets that we've learned. My name is Kathy Endres. I'm the Senior Vice President of Research at the Josh Wilson Company. Um, my background is about half of my career has been in consulting, management consulting, and the other half in um, practitioner world in large organizations. And now I'm doing research on all topics of employee experience, learning and development, talent, and, and all those kind of topics. I'm originally from Austria, trying to guess the accent. And Carly, over to you now. Thank you, Kathy. Hi, everyone. Carly Ackerman. I'm a customer success executive at Eightfold. Um, I joined the team to support our biggest customers with the, um, the crunchiest issues that they're trying to address with Eightfold and with AI. Um, so I'm really excited today to share a little bit of, as Kathy mentioned, the secrets that we've been able to identify thus far. I joined Eightfold after many years in management consulting, and I was actually in public education prior to that. Uh, so just a, a quick overview of our agenda for today. Uh, this is not a typo. <laughs> the first topic that we want to talk about is the great resignation, uh, but we think that it might be a misnomer and that there might be some other themes that we need to be exploring. We'll then talk about what is the irresistible employee experience and a framework for really thinking about it. We'll reveal a few secrets along the way. And then, of course, we want to give you a couple of clear and actionable next steps for getting started. So with that, I will jump into the content. So at this point, we're over two years into the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're nearly as far into a period of unprecedented job turnover for what's been going on in the job market. Sure, the great resignation seems to be the dramatic front runner in terms of what we want to call this, but there are a lot of alternative names that seem to be getting to the heart of the matter. We've heard the great reshuffle, the re-evaluation, the reset. This one might be a stretch, but the reckoning. <laughs> um, we've arrived at a point where we really have to stop trying to name it and start doing something about it. And what we're really excited to share here in terms of the headlines is we're starting to see some, some signs that organizations are really working to understand the trends, including workers' motivations. And in fact, a lot of organizations have actually started to take a stab at introducing those solutions. Um, but let's take a look back at some of the data. Kathy, I'll turn it to you. Thank you. Um, so the war for talent is of course on. If you look at this list of the jobs open, it's literally every job from truck drivers to retail workers, software engineers, marketing managers, and of course nurses. We have so many jobs open today and finding, attracting, and retaining talent is a massive priority, I think, for every company out here. And that's probably one of the reasons why you joined us today. And it's a, a, it's a big, big challenge. Um, the quit rate which is the percentage of people who voluntarily quit their jobs every month, is at an all-time high. Almost 3% of the workforce quit each month. So if you multiply that by 12, it's 36%. That's more than a third of the workforce that are leaving their jobs every year. And of them, two-thirds do not have another job even lined up. And the reason for that is they're exhausted. They don't want to commit their time and their lives to a work or businesses where they don't feel they have trust and control over what might suddenly hit them one fine day. And it's important. It's really important to pause and reflect. Uh, why is that? Is that the impact of the change that's happening in the workforce or is it the an inability of organizations to manage the change effectively? Employee experience. Employee experience is really a buzzword that every company and every vendor is using today on, on their 
home pages or on their career pages. Let's take a step back and think about where this discipline really came from. Where it came from was industrial engineering, where actually people studied things like how much weight a worker could carry without breaking down or with, without getting hurt. And then we, um, we uh, saw that actually just the physical strength was not enough to have um, the best output from people. So we studied IO psychology studies focusing on retention and now, of course, doing more frequent pulse service still mostly driven by a job, but today employee experience, if it's done right, it's a design challenge. And it needs to involve the entire company with the end result being to enable productivity and performance of everybody. So not just productivity, but performance as well. And what happens in performance is of course, well-being, psychological safety, all of those things actually come in there because when people are engaged, they are higher performing, but it also goes the other way around. When we work well and get a lot of stuff done, we are also much more engaged. So it's really a two-way street. So Holly, we promise secret. Here's yeah. our first secret. Uh, perhaps the right re-word that we need to be thinking about is actually relationship, our relationship to our work, or maybe even responsibility, the responsibility of organizations to help workers navigate that new relationship. So we need to just stop fearing the great reword uh, and start looking at it as an opportunity for organizations and employees to really reflect on what has and has not worked over the past two years and to start designing for the future. Because we know after all, if there's anything we've learned through the pandemic, we need to start planning for a future that is fundamentally and totally different from the status quo of the past 20 plus years. So what's the secret here? We need to start exploring new tools for navigating the future. What got us here, maybe a, a paper map, so to speak, isn't going to get us there. Maybe something more like a GPS. So how do we start to harness this opportunity? And this is where we want to pause for our first question. Hold your, your responses here for a moment. We'll, we'll flip to a slide where you can enter your response. Uh, but the first question really is, how important is employee experience to your company today? And while you're thinking about that, Kathy, I'm going to ask you a question while folks respond. I'd love to hear your biggest aha from the recent research that you conducted around this definitive guide for employee experience. Cool. Yeah, that sounds great. And I'll be curious how important employee experience is for everybody's company. Hopefully very important because otherwise you wouldn't have joined us. But um, yeah, let's, let's think about what was the biggest aha for me. Um, one big aha that I had, and I'll share that with you in a little bit too, some of the details is employee experience, while tools and support systems are really important, it's not enough. So it's not enough just to give people great tools, great work tools, because if you think about it, if you have great work tools, great support systems, great um, resources, but you don't feel what you're doing is actually important to what you want to do with your life. If you don't feel like you can grow, um, you can develop as a person, probably you won't be all that engaged and you probably won't be able to do your best work. So one, th one thought and one big aha I had was what really matters to employee experience was not really what I had, had expected it to be. And we'll share with you more what the, what matters is about. And I'll be really curious how important um, employee experience is for every company. We hear that it's a C-suite priority a lot of times, but then when you go down to talking with, can we talk with the CEO about it? A lot of companies still say, well, not really my CEO. Yeah, he, he thinks it's important or he or she thinks it's important or they think it's important, but maybe um, other things are even more important. Maybe the market, maybe the, um, the business environment, may, maybe your customer environment, maybe where, how you're positioning your product is really what they want to talk about most. So let's see where people land. I know we're, we're getting some responses in there. All right. So that's, that's interesting. So critically important, a C-suite priority, almost 20%, 40% said it's very important, a high priority for leadership, HR, IT, and other functions. Important, it's a priority for HR and IT, about 23%, somewhat important, 16 or 17%, not important, that's kind of sad, and something else, um, I don't know what the something else would be, but so, 
um, a lot of people, actually 60% of you say it's either critically important or very important, which is great. So let's dive a little bit deeper into how to get started on this. So let me talk a little bit how all of these uh, best place to work place uh, lists fit in there. What makes your employee experience really great? We did a big study around over a thousand companies, a thousand and twenty companies to be exact, were on these four best place to work lists that we have listed here on the side. And um, when you looked, we wanted to see how much overlap there was. And only six of these were on all four lists. That's half a percentage point. So you don't really know what good looks like. And if you don't know what good looks like, how will you ever get there? How will you get that GPS that Kali talked about? What's interesting, however, is that despite the fact that the royal we have yet to signal that we can all agree on what a fabulous employee experience looks like, employees have been telling us, they've been clear about this, 65% want to have access to some sort of upskilling program. That's really no surprise when you consider the fact that 66% believe that they need to learn new skills just to stay relevant and employable. And 71% of workers put learning and development in their list of top 10 most important factors for working life, especially when they think about the other side of the pandemic, the working life after the pandemic. And we thought it was just interesting to point out that Gen Z in particular ranked this as number four. So we know what folks want. What are we doing about it? All right, so let's take a step back and look at this big study that we did because we actually know what matters to an employee experience. But before we go there, I wanted to share with you how you can define employee experience. And we see employee experience really, really very broadly, not just um, journey maps or design thinking or tools or services. Employee experience really has to cover everything an employee experiences in their work day and in their life with the, uh, with the company. So when we did this big study of over a thousand companies, we studied 85 practices um, and identified which ones drive not just engagement, but also financial performance, customer satisfaction and innovation. So it's really, um, when you think about employee experience, it's really anything that the employee does and experiences. Think about the time when you were most pro productive and happiest and most engaged with your work. What was it like? You were probably feeling like you were doing meaningful work, you were in the right job, and you could do the job with a lot of autonomy. You were working with great teams, and your manager was great and supportive, and they helped you with coaching and feedback. You had the right tools and processes and flexibility to do work where you wanted to do it, and you felt like you were part of a great team. You were also supported to be healthy and well and not stressed. You were learning something new every day, and you had fun doing so. And you looked up to the leaders in the company to be transparent and ethical and focus on more than just making money. It's really a complex field, and it's challenging to get your arms around. So we wanted to understand what really matters most. It touches everything we do in HR and in leadership and in business today, and not just HR, of course. It also touches IT and finance and legal and operation and everything. And it touches every employee differently, of course. When you think, for example, about a barista at Starbucks, they have a very different experience to the finance person in Starbucks. The Amazon warehouse worker needs something very different than the software developer at AWS. So one size really doesn't fit all. And the way your people and your management practices are designed need to fit who your employees are. This is also where hybrid work comes in, by the way. Think about uh, this, this experience of the barista, for example. Is my schedule flexible? Can I give the customer a cup of co uh, coffee for free if something went wrong with their order? Can I access my pay as soon as I've earned it and not have to wait for two weeks? Do I have career pathways into other areas to develop? Uh, Walmart, for example, is developing 5,000 store associates into pharmacists for their retail pharmacies. And the impact is just amazing because it helps people make a great living and a better living. And then last but not least, do I feel the company invests in me? Do the values come through or are they just words on a page? We call all of this the irresistible organization because all these elements and these dimensions together make your company irresistible. So let's look at 
which of these areas, which of all these areas actually matter most? Let's look at that. So the way this heat map goes, it's a heat map of impact. And the darker the color, the more impactful the dimensions of all, uh, to these outcomes that I described. Financial performance, customer satisfaction, of course, employee engagement and, uh, and, and retention, but then also innovation and change agility. Look at what jumps out of this page, the, the darkest colors. It's really about trust, transparency, inclusion, care. Those are the things that matter most. Is that a surprise or did you expect that? That was one of my bigger hearts there to see how much actually this trust in the organization really matters. We busted a lot of myth with that. For example, one of the myth we busted here is employee experience is all about tools and digital and flexible work. It's not true. Yes, of course, we need great tools to be productive, but if you have great digital experiences, but you can't voice your opinion, are you going to be your best and do your best? The next myth we busted too is people join companies, but they leave managers. It's also not true. People join companies and they actually leave companies. Your poor middle managers can't make up for the downfall of your senior leaders or if the business is doing something that's just unethical or not very important to what, where people want to go. The third myth we had is if we just throw a lot of well-being tools at people, they will not be burned out and they will be happy and healthy. Janet Merson's uh, research director just led a massive study on this area, which we call the healthy organization. I talked with an HR leader in a big tech company here in the Silicon Valley where I live, and she told me that they thought they'd give people yoga classes and meditation programs to de-stress, but then they heard from their employees, I don't need a yoga class after I work 60 hours, I just don't need to work 60 hours a week. So all of these well-being perks might not be as important as you think. The other myth we busted here, and I could go on and on about myths, that's the last one I'll cover, is you can't really pay your way into a great employee experience. Of course, money opens doors, but when we don't wake up every day and look at our paycheck and are super excited about that. It only goes so far. And those organizations that actually put the mission first, they have a powerful mission, like, for example, Unilever, they were well be prepared, and we have a great case study on them as well. Microsoft, for example, aligns everything to the mission to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Very, very powerful. Deutsche Telekom's mission is, I will not stop until everybody is connected. And of course, in the pandemic, that took on a new meaning when connection, like technical connectivity, can mean the difference between isolation and inclusion, education and illiteracy, work and unemployment. What about trust? How do you create trust? Trust really comes from three things. It comes from listening, and we'll talk more about listening in a bit, competence, that your leaders know what they're doing, and ethics, doing the right things. Trust is also a two-way street, by, by the way. If you don't trust your employees, they won't trust you. If you have kind of these rigid hybrid work policies or any of these rigid policies, it shows you don't trust your employees, and in turn, they won't trust your company. So let's let's go, Khalid, over to you, and let's think about how we want to take this forward in terms of this heat map. Yeah, so we don't want to try to address everything all at once. Um, so if you think back to our first secret, and Kathy, I'm thinking we should have called this myth-busting and secrets. That would have made it really <laughs> interesting. Um, if you think back to that first secret, that we need to find new tools to navigate our relationship with work. We're highlighting here where we think you can stand to gain the most by really doubling down your approach to talent management. So to extend this metaphor even more, if I may, swapping your compass, or maybe it's just a finger in the air at this point, for a full-blown <laughs> GPS can help you move the needle on enabling agile teams, creating inclusive and diverse work environments where workers really feel that they belong, and facilitating mobility and career growth opportunities, which we know are a top priority for workers. And all of these little incremental changes, they're going to add up to a clear demonstration of your commitment as a leader to continuously investing in people's lives. So that's why we're highlighting a few here, just to make sure that we can really be laser focused on the areas where we think you have an ability to make an immediate impact. That's great, Carly. Let's think about why all of this matters. Engagement, of course, is an important outcome of a great employee experience, but it's not the only one. 
When companies leverage the right employee experience strategies, we'll tell you more about what they are in a bit, they are also much more likely to be financially high performing, they delight their customers, and they innovate effectively. And of course, innovation and change agility in this time of um, change every day and, and um, fundamental change that we talked about is, is really, really key. The right employee experience strategies, by the way, they're all cultural systemic changes. They don't happen very quickly, but without them, you can't sustain your business success. Companies that recognize that great customer outcomes are not possible without an amazing employee experience, they are much more successful. So don't just think about employee experience as the nuts and bolts of to get employees more engaged, but also customer satisfaction, financial performance, innovation. Lego, for example, was a bit of a business in a business slowdown. Um, so they redesigned their leadership model bottom up. And with that, the employee experience was was much better for everybody. And now they're much more profitable than ever before. We have a great case study on them, by the way, and they call that the leadership playground, uh, which is kind of really exciting. When we looked at at these 85 employee experience pra practices, above average pay and benefits were the number, uh, we ordered all of these 85 practices and we had two questions on pay. Uh, one of them was about, are you offering above average pay and benefits? And the other one was about fair and equitable pay. And the one about above average pay and benefits was number 75 in terms of impact. So pretty close to the bottom of the pile. And the one about, um, Pay and equitable pay was number six, I think. Why is that? Money alone doesn't fix anything. It, it may get you into the door. It may get you great people to join you. And um, But then when the work is not good or they can't trust your leadership or they just don't feel they can develop and grow, they might, might just leave, turn around and leave you. Or even worse, they might stay with you because you offer them so much money but they will absolutely be checked out and not be able to do their best work. All right, I think it's time for another poll. So again, just hold your responses till we flip to the next page. But the next question here is, which of the following do you think is the most important to retaining employees? So while folks are, are thinking about that, Kathy, when you and I last chatted, we discussed that part of rethinking our relationship with work is for leaders to really make sure that work aligns with their workers' highest level of experience or expertise. So I'd love for you to dig into that a little bit with us while, while folks are responding. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really, really good question um, around the work itself, because the work itself um, is, is really something that drives, if you think about um, your experience, of course, what work you do is the core of your employee experience, right? Um, one thing that we have discovered, we are talking with a ton of healthcare companies, right, uh, healthcare organizations right now about their issues with um, attracting nurses, uh, the nurse challenge, the nurse shortage, of course, is a huge problem right now, and everybody knows about this. Uh, but one concept that we discovered there, which I think applies to everybody, not just healthcare organizations, is the concept of operating at top of your license. So in, in um, healthcare, and I used to work in healthcare as a practitioner for like eight years, um, so I know that concept. But the, the concept of top of license is really, really important. Basically, what that means is in the healthcare context, it means that a nurse can practice nursing stuff most of the time. But when we talk with most of the healthcare organizations, they tell us nurses probably do nursing things that they are uniquely qualified for only 30% of the time, 70% of the time to do other stuff that's actually lower qualified, lower lower educated. And it really applies to all of our work too. If you think about your job, your work, are you doing the things that you are uniquely qualified, that you are actually educated, you have the experience for most of the time? Or are you doing most of the time work that's less highly skilled, less highly um, experienced, and that just in the end of the day, won't um, engage you very much. We talked with a big financial services company and they told us, um, the head of uh, um, talent there told us, he's, he sees a lot of times that their managers hire data scientists 
and then these people do data cleanup most of the time. Well, what's going to happen to a highly qualified data scientist if they do data cleanup all the time? They're probably not going to be very engaged. They're going to hate their job. They say, this is really boring. I thought I'd do something much more interesting. And they're going to either leave you or leave in place, as we just talked about. So think about how can you design work to make it happen top of license or top of qualification. That's like a very important concept that we identified there. And I think to extend it a little bit further, making sure people are in the right role to begin with based upon that experience and background and potential that they have. Absolutely. I think a lot of managers actually overhire because they say, I'd love to do this data scientist. Actually, at some point, data scientist work, but right now we're not there. Right. So they hire these super highly overqualified people, but then they don't think about how the work actually then experienced is experienced by these people. And, and of course, then you get the whole great re, re whatever we talked about. <laughs> well, let's see how folks responded. Yeah, let's see the, the results of the poll. All right, that's that's interesting. So greater visibility into internal career opportunities um, is a very important area, and we're going to talk about that a lot too. Creating a, an inclusive work environment is very important too, so that's great. Hybrid work, it's, it's really um, pretty evenly distributed, as I see here. Offering better pay and or benefits, um, less important. I just read that inflation is driving that too. Um, of course, and you got to pay well, but just offering more pay without doing anything else is, is not going to create this great e employee experience. So I'm glad we're all on the same page here. Kali, you want to take it away? Yeah, and I think that leads us to our next top secret. Um, so as Kathy shared earlier, the research has really helped us understand and prioritize what matters most to our workers and to employees. That said, the hard reality is that what matters most cannot be addressed with a Band-Aid. The kinds of adjust adjustments that we're talking about and the changes that workers are demanding are going to require long-term foundational change. So we're showing here that these are changes that require DNA level changes. So first, Kathy's talked a lot about trust. This creating an irresistible experience is not about throwing money at a problem. We can't just offer above market pay, for example. We have to demonstrate that trustworthiness through solutions like providing fair and equitable pay. And at the end of the day, that might just upend the way that we've been thinking about compensation for decades. It's going to require real work to reconsider. When it comes to providing people with learning and development opportunities, again, we can't just offer up quick fixes. We can send employees to conferences and we can call it a learning investment. That's a really nice thing to offer. But those types of experiences are not likely going to be career changing events or something that can support long term and sustained career growth. So we have to make real long term commitments to career growth, ideally within your organization. People want to see themselves over the long haul within their organization. So show your people that there is a place for them within the organization. So part of the irresistible framework that we haven't really touched on is this bottom section here, the enabling technologies and services that support the framework. And I know that these are this, again, we're not going to position technology as the silver bullet here, but in the spirit of making DNA level changes, these below the surface enablers can be leveraged to achieve the outcomes organizations are trying to drive, such as providing employees with those equitable growth opportunities or maybe it's facilitating more personalized experiences as it relates to career growth. But what does this look like in action? Lots of, lots of lip service here, but what does it really look like? We wanted to provide what you know, could be a, a real life scenario here. I think all of us probably can identify with that moment in your career when you're asking yourself, where am I today on my career journey? Where do I wanna go? Where can I go? What's the art of the possible? And how do I get there? Today, we're finding that organizations really expect employees to answer these questions on their own, but we know that there's a better way. So I keep going back to secret one. I think it might be the, the top, top of the top secrets from today's session. Um, and it's really about those new tools for navigation. We're now able to leverage AI powered solutions to support workers as they address all of their classic career questions. We can help an employee define where they are today. And that's not just in terms of what they can jam into a one page resume, 
but rather we can help them enrich that experience by helping them really understand what they've done, the skills that they have, and the plans that they've made to date. We can provide people with options. Maybe they wanna follow the straight and narrow path. Maybe they know the exact leadership level role, role where they're headed, or maybe what they want to explore something an alternative path might lead them towards. Once they've defined a North Star, or maybe they explore several potential North Stars, we can help employees understand the skill and experience gaps that they'll need to close. And better yet, we can actually help them determine what they need to do to close those gaps. So it's one thing to understand, you know, where am I headed and where are their potential roadblocks? It's even more helpful to be able to understand where are the detours and the alternative routes to get there. Yeah. I I, I loved actually your example, Carly, that you shared with me before we when we talked before about your own journey. So I'd love to maybe we can have a little conversation when we get to the next poll. But yeah. uh, let's look at why companies actually can't hire from the outside anymore. I shared with you all these open jobs, these 15 million where like I think 15 million jobs are open right now, which is almost one in 10 working Americans jobs basically. Uh, are open right now. And, and the way that this this would look like is if you walk through an office, if we were in a physical office again, every 10th seat would be empty. So that's that's really a lot of open seats, right? So these are statistics that we get from, from Eightfold that, that you guys did, Kali, when we looked at companies, how much internal hiring or external hiring they do. And um, you see these, these statistics up to 74% of this one big insurance company, we don't name them here, but all of these companies, uh, Global Pharma, almost 50%, 26% in healthcare tech. Uh, we talk with a lot of, um, a lot of um, um, healthcare companies too, and they told us, one of the health, big uh, healthcare systems in, the, in New York told us they have a goal of hiring 60% of their, all of their jobs from within. Um, previous applicants, of course, is, a, is a, big, um, a big source of talent too, because when you get to the silver medalists, right, those people that you didn't choose, you have a ton of highly qualified and probably highly engaged people if you treated them well in the, in the previous recruiting process that would still want to work for your company. And of course, you have all these people that in your company that might choose a different career path, um, as we just talked about. So lots and lots of opportunity there to not just look outside, but look within. So I, I wanted to share a story um, where we've actually seen an organization start to implement the building blocks of this irresistible employee experience. So this organization happened to be a top 10 financial services company that was, as I'm sure many of you all have experienced, struggling to find technical talent. Instead of completely overhauling its recruiting efforts, it actually decided to structure its talent transformation around enabling internal mobility, finding opportunities for people who are already members of the organization to upskill and reskill into new roles. They saw this as their opportunity to reduce attrition, and they were doing so by demonstrating their commitment to growing their existing employees' careers. So leaders at this organization opted to introduce a new tool to navigate the future. They took out their GPS. They leveraged AI to match employees with the right internal opportunities. And Kathy, I think this also speaks to your point earlier about finding the roles that really meet the top end of folks' experience and capability and providing them with the tools that they needed to understand their options and what they needed to do to successfully make an internal move. They were also able to give business leaders access to data, and that would really help the business leaders understand their current employees' skills and to then benchmark against industry, the industry so that they could do a little bit more proactive planning against their workforce needs and their future workforce needs. So what's really cool about this is that this organization was able to see significant improvements in internal mobility rates. What I thought was particularly interesting was that a lot of it was cross departmental swaps. Um, and I know oftentimes that folks really you know, have a bit of a grip on the teams that fall within their departments, but this organization created a culture where it was safe to move across departments and to fill gaps across business units. And they were able to see improvements, initial improvements within the first two weeks of introducing this, this GPS for folks' career. So I think this brings us to our last poll, hold your answers until we swap. But 
what has been your biggest challenge to implementing enabling technology? And Kathy, you talk to leaders all day, every day on their challenges. What are some of the common themes that you hear from leaders around those, those challenges to leveraging technology or perhaps to bringing about a huge cultural change? Yeah, and I'm so glad, Kali, you mentioned culture here because culture is, is one of the big issues. Like these, what we hear from employees and from companies that use systems like Eightfold, for example, for a talent marketplace or talent mobility is they can't keep the employees out. Every time you give it to employees and you pilot it, somebody finds out um, there's actually this system, this navigator that helps you move your career into any direction that you want to go, but then also that helps the, the, the organization and have, has you have a better job in the company. People would love to be part of that. So it's not one of these systems that you have to push on employees. It's really something that employees love to do. And of course, if it's easy to use, like eightfold system of course is, um, uh, then people just want to use it more so. But culture sometimes gets in the way a lot. We hear a lot of the talent hoarding, right? So managers saying, well, I don't want to let go of my best people, right? Because who's going to do my best work then if my best people go somewhere else in the company? But what they don't realize, of course, is, well, people might either go to another place in the company or they're going to leave you all together. There's really no holding people back, right? You won't have that, well, if you hold, try to hold on to them in your company, you won't let them, or in your team, you won't let them go somewhere else in the company, then they're just going to quit and they're just going to take their talents and their all of their experience um, elsewhere. So really, like starting with the culture, helping managers to see that talent is actually an enterprise asset, not a business unit or not a team asset, right? And you really can't control talent because enabling people to go the direction they need to go and they want to go for to do their best work and to, to be who they're meant to be, that's really where it's at. So culture is, is kind of one of the big things. Of course, systems, having the right systems, the right clarity, the right transparency and easy to use system, really, really important. Without that, you can't really make any of these more strategic moves. Getting insights um, from systems to what skills and capabilities do you already have in your company and what skills and capabilities will you need in the future and where do you have gaps and how can you match or move people into these areas where you're going to have some some gaps in the future building like that long-term view is also really really important as well so yeah i think just... there were there will always be a shiny toy but weaving it into the fabric of your organization is really the the critical component here i love how you so, say that Ali. yeah it's great shall we uh shall we check out how folks responded yes let's do it let's do it all right so stakeholder buy-in the biggest one yeah that goes probably also with the culture that <laughs> that i talked about so do leaders actually buy into all of these enabling technologies legacy systems of course having a lot of legacy systems and um lack of clarity where to start because there are so many things to start um we'll talk a little bit more about where to start and how to get started maybe uh when we open it up to questions i saw some of them come in so pretty even distribution, but stakeholder buy-in is really, really important. And stakeholder buy-in, of course, goes with the business case too, right? So how can you make a business case for something that's not just HR driven, but they really the business owns? And um, the most successful companies that we talk with, they actually start where the business sees a need for all of these internal things and not, not try to push it somewhere where the business might not be ready. So it's really important. Well, we promised folks some actionable next steps. So let's let's go there before we reveal our last secret. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive or detailed change management plan, but it does give you a sense of the considerations you need to have in mind as you start your journey. So just as Kathy mentioned, what is the business case? What costs can you potentially optimize? But I would also challenge you to think about what value will you be creating? Who are the stakeholders? How are they going to get something out of this? And what's in it for them? Who and what will be impacted? And how are you going to plan to mitigate those impacts? Classic change management questions. Which processes are you going to have to completely overhaul to make sure that whatever you are introducing can be woven into the fabric of your organization? 
what does the culture need to look and what does it need to feel like? And what are the behaviors that you're going to look for as the leading indicators that your culture has actually shifted? How will you train and reskill the folks who will be most impacted? And what's the long game here? How are you going to support and sustain this change over time? It's one thing to you know, get it in and get it started and off the ground, but oftentimes these things die on the vine if they're not nurtured over time. So Kathy, I think you have the, the honor of revealing our last secret. Yeah, and maybe that's not a secret. Maybe that's something that we already know, but it's about leadership. So we talked about stakeholder buy-in, we talked about culture, um, we talked about just leadership in general, the role of leaders in inspiring trust. All of this goes back to um, a different concept of leadership. And we call that human-centered leadership versus business-centered leadership. Business-centered leadership is, um, the role of leaders is we lead the business and people will come along for the right. So we'll bring people along. If we manage the business well, customers, um, the market, financial performance, all of those more technical things, business-centric things, then we bring people along and they're going to love it. And that usually doesn't work so well because you see people as a means to an end, not the end itself. Um, Human-centered leadership, and we have um, a great program also in the Josh Burson Academy around it. It's one of our most popular programs, by the way, uh, where we uh, help you understand how to create what we call human-centered leadership. So the concept there is thinking about you lead the people as a leader and they in turn drive the business forward. It goes with autonomy, it goes with empowerment, it goes, goes with career um, development, inclusion, all the things we talked about just right now. When you see people as the purpose of the business itself and that in turn makes you successful, it's just a much better uh, approach to how you lead your business. And it inspires trust and transparency and ethics and care all the things that actually matter most in, in employee experience. So with that, I think, are we ready to take some questions? We can turn to audience questions in just a moment. Great. This webcast is sponsored by Eightfold AI. Eightfold AI delivers the talent intelligence platform the most effective way for companies to retain top performers, upskill, and reskill the workforce, recruit top talent efficiently, and reach diversity goals. Eightfold AI's deep learning artificial intelligence platform empowers enterprises to turn talent management into a competitive advantage. For more information, visit eightfold.ai. And don't forget to register for Eightfold's upcoming conference, Cultivate 22, taking place May 10th through 11th online and in person in Napa, California, and the Josh Burson Company Conference, Irresistible, taking place May 23rd through 25th in Los Angeles. There are links to these events in the program resources area and in the program PDF. All right, let's turn to some of the questions that are coming in. We'll start here uh, with uh, audience member who asks, what's the role of technology in EX? Yeah, l let me get started on this, and maybe, um, Kali, I'd love for you to jump in, too. So when we studied, we actually, when we studied all the things that I showed you on this map for the irresistible organization, we also studied the role of technology, and we studied many different technology options, and the technologies that actually matter most are what I call insights technology. So those are technologies like people analytics technology, knowledge management, and learning technology. Um, that help you get insights or employees get insights, uh, not so much the transactional systems. Transactional systems are more things that help you, I don't know, submit tickets or like um, basically remove obstacles in, in your work systems if your, I don't know, your Teams doesn't work or your, your Outlook doesn't work. Of course, these are important, but they're not enough. So insights technologies, and Kali talked about the, the GPS and AI, um, those are the technologies that actually matter most because they help your employees get better careers, get the careers they're meant to, to be. They help them like fulfill their mission, their purpose in life. Uh, really, really important. They help them learn and grow and develop. We talked about that too. They help you listen to employees well and understand what, what are the barriers to a good employee experience. Listening, by the way, is kind of 
one of these superpowers that you have in, in business. I could talk about listening for an entire hour itself, uh, but listening to employees, helping them understand uh, and helping your managers and your leaders understand what gets in the way of a great employee experience. All of these insights applications are really, really most important, impactful. Kali, what do you think? Yeah, the only thing I would add, I, I love a good analogy. Uh, so I think what you're talking about in terms of insights, it's about predicting the news instead of reporting on it. So looking for the types of solutions that will help you look into the future, see around the bend, rather than focusing on historical data and what has already happened to identify trends. Trends are really important. I think they help us when it comes to predicting, but there are tools that support predictive analysis as well. So um, I, I would just, you know, just to add the additional layer of what we mean by insights driven technologies, um, that's my, my way of kind of wrapping my head around it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think AI really plays into that in a big way, right? Because how can you predict or shape even the future? I think when I think about predicting the future, can I also shape the future in a different way? Can I, as you said, see around corners? And for that, AI is really important. So you want to talk a little bit about how AI fits in there, Kali? Yeah, I mean, I think because AI is so dependent upon data and massive data sets, making them sing the same tune, speak the same language so that you can actually compare data sets um, across time periods, that's where you're starting to see the power of starting to predict what's going to happen in the future based upon the patterns of the, of the past, of course. But understanding the relationships between data points is going to be critical. Within my, my context um, with, at Eightfold, of course, we focus on skills. So being able to understand the relationship between the skills somebody has today and the skills that they could potentially have in the future, that's where you're starting to draw the connection between what's the potential of this person moving into the future of their career. And I love, um, I think, you're, uh, how you are thinking about skills and where you'd get actually the skills data from, Carly, because the way that I understand it, Eightfold actually doesn't just get skills data from job posting, which are a little bit of a lagging indicator. If you think about your job postings, right? As soon as you have posted a job, it's kind of obsolete because anytime somebody starts in a job that you have posted, they do something different, right? So inferring skills, not just from job postings, but from employee data, skills inference, all of those kind of things that Eightfold does, I think that's really where it's at. Because if you look at all of our profiles, Eightfold probably knows a lot about me just looking at my, my LinkedIn profile, right? Because uh, it will know who I worked with, what I worked on, just knowing which companies I worked for and when and all of that. So I think that's a really a different way of looking at skills and inferring skills. Yeah, before we go to the next question, just to, to hammer it home, um, I'm an example of how Eightfold works. Um, I actually just submitted my resume into the system and I have no customer success experience, technically speaking, right? Nobody would look at my background and say, great, come to a startup and be a customer success leader. But because of the experiences that I had and because Eightfold was able to infer that the skills and experiences that I had collected over time would help me be successful in an adjacent type of role, that's how I actually ended up where I am today. Um, so just you know, imagine that at scale, if you were able to support that within an organization, um, helping people find alternative paths, whether it's you know, following the straight and narrow or, or potentially exploring something totally different. I love that because I think the old fashioned, maybe the old school way is just looking at like your job titles. And of course your job title never said customer success experience, like experience or something like that. But um, as you've worked in consulting, as you've worked in, in education, um, thinking about customers and educating them and helping them be most successful is, is something that you've done all your career. So I think that's a really good example. Cool. Should we take another question? We've got plenty of them. Let's go to this one. A viewer asks, how do you change a culture from business centric to people centric? Our leaders are short staffed and they don't seem to have the inclination or energy to really take care of their team members appropriately? Oh, that's a great question. I'll start with that. Um, and, and then Carly, I'd love to get your thoughts too. But um, 
Yeah, I think the way, of course, leaders are always short-staffed, right? And they have so many things. And your poor middle managers that I talked about before, too, you add more and more to the pile. Don't think about adding to the pile, just thinking about it differently. So talking with your team members is not another thing they have to do, of course. It's the thing that they have to do as their work. So helping employees develop and do their work better is not another thing. It is the core of the management job. If you don't want to do that, it's probably not the right job for you. I think a lot of people, a lot of organizations promote people into management positions because they're great at that job. If you're a great salesperson, you get to be a sales manager. If you're a great software engineer, you get to be a, a director of engineering or something like that. But many of these people, and my husband is, is a good example, he's a software engineer, and he does not want to manage any people because what he loves to do is develop great code that's really good, right? So think about, are people actually motivated to do the people management part of management? And can you have another kind of parallel career path for people to also advance in the organization without managing people? Because it's a separate skill set. It's a separate motivation. It's a separate education, really. And the more you can tap into that and, and just have people basically in people manager roles that love to do, love to talk with people, love to work with them on their career, on their development. That's really where it's at. Kali, anything you'd add? I, the, I would just point us back to uh, earlier in the conversation, we had talked about how do you build a business case around this? Um, and I think this being employee experience as both a culturally driven and technology enabled pursuit and while we started with the traditional cost optimization tagline, there's also another clearly important piece of this around value and meaning. What's the value and meaning that you'll be driving by making this shift? So I really appreciate your point of, you know, working with your people and supporting your people is the job of leadership. Um, but I think that part of making the case for a leader who might otherwise be deeply embedded in so much work that it's very hard for them to come up for breath, like having a little bit of empathy for that level of stress. Um, I think building a business case that not only talks about the where you stand to cut costs, but also where you stand to drive additional value through the business, right? Anchoring it all in the business. Um, I, I think that's where you're, maybe this is another secret to add to the list, but I think that's the secret sauce in terms of um, making the the case to leaders that this is an, a mindset that they need to adopt. Yeah, if you free up leaders' time to actually not do so much of the doing and do more of the leading, you can do that by empowering the employees to do more of the doing, right? So, so I think that's that's a really good point. We put together a couple of related questions. One of our viewers asked, "How does an HR department of one approach a full scale, scope change management project?" Most of my day is spent staying a step ahead of the next project along with other initiatives outside of HR responsibilities. And not everybody's in the Department of One, but we do have many people in smaller organizations. Another viewer writes, how do you do all of this when you're an organization of only 100 employees? There are only so many positions one can move into. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And when we actually did this big employee experience study, we also cut all these results uh, by um, by organization size. And what we found out, um, small organizations are actually pretty good at creating great employee experience. Large organizations are pretty good at doing that too because they have a lot of resources and processes. It's the ones in the middle that, that really jump in there or that really don't have um, that um, the, the processes and the tools to do that. So in small organizations, I'd call on... Um, Usually people, every person knows the founder, knows the CEO, knows the leadership personally. A lot easier to establish trust in leadership when you actually know the people and talk with them every day. In large organizations, you can dedicate a lot of resources to establish trust and transparency and, and great leadership cultures and all of that. It's the, the mid-sized companies that struggle most in our perspective. So in, in large co companies, just think about what can you build on um, in, in your company that's really inspiring people to join you and to stay with you. And that could be your mission, that could be um, how approachable leaders are. Any of those things actually matter and just build on that. So you, 
don't don't overcomplicate it is is my point on for small companies usually the high touch the personal connection really goes a long way yeah i would i would just echo that kathy that i've i've had the experience of working in a huge multinational organization and in a tiny organization and i think the the difference really is in establishing reasonable targets and milestones for yourself um, I think in a huge organization where you can move really quickly simply by brute force, maybe you can establish some very fast turnaround timelines for it. In an organization where maybe you have a little bit more agility because your organization is smaller, but you don't have the the power, the, the power behind it in terms of number of people to support it, establish some realistic timelines. Don't just poo-poo it because it feels too big. Make small incremental changes over a longer period of time. Love that. We don't have much time left. Let me try and squeeze in this last question. A viewer asked, what's your recommendation for getting buy-in from the executive leadership team? Kali, you want to go first? You had all these great steps, and then I can add. Yeah, I, I, I think, again, it goes back to the business case. You know, oftentimes leadership wants to see dollars and cents, and that's great. Show cost optimization, optimization opportunities but also think about the longer term value uh, that you can derive. And when I talk about uh, value and meaning that you can derive from this type of work, how are you going to gain additional culture points around supporting uh, reduction in attrition, right? If people want to be part of the organization, maybe that's not something that you can tie a dollar, to, a dollar figure to, but it's something that you can show this will allow us to innovate more quickly over time. This will drive some of our key priorities that we have that are not necessarily business oriented. Um, make sure that you are creating that case that shows both sides of the coin. Uh, but Kathy, I don't know if you have another point to add there as well. Yeah, I'd just add, I think these are great points. One, one approach we found that successful is if you find like one ally on the senior leadership team, so find the one person whom it resonates with most, right? It could be the CIO, the CEO, the chief technology office is the CHRO, anybody who is on this senior leadership team who is already thinking along that human-centered, culturally oriented and employee empowering way and work with them to, to get the leadership buy-in. Don't try to do it all yourself. All right, thank you. We are coming to the end of this program. Before we sign off, we want to thank Kathy Enderes, PhD from the Josh Burson Company, and Carly Ackerman from Eightfold AI for the information they provided today. And we want to thank everyone tuning in for being with us and for choosing Sherm for HR webcasts. That concludes this program.